Welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. If you were an alien looking down on the blue planet from your spaceship, you might see humans and think, those animals sure are productive. Look at all the technology, the cityscapes, the widely varying ecosystems all around the globe, conquered by this one weird species of hairless ape. It's amazing how busy humans have been since the Industrial Revolution. How one mammal could have such dominion over a whole planet. Even with all the feats in engineering and colonization of new territories, there's one thing humans are maybe more prolific at than anything else. If you consider it by mass, there's one mission that remains consistent across time, across national and cultural boundaries. One human undertaking that we don't seem to be letting up on at all. Extracting biodegraded plants and animals in the form of crude oil and through processing, distillation, fractionation, chemistry, and catalysis, creating nearly indestructible plastics that are so chemically stable that they'll easily outlast most of the materials making up the buildings and roads. Using these amazing materials for 15 minutes and then depositing them almost immediately in the ocean. The human appetite for new plastic and its distaste for the old is creating a plastic-infused biosphere and whole new islands in the Pacific. Beavers might be able to build dams, but humans are erecting whole new continents. The Pacific garbage patch seems made up how could any group of animals be so destructively productive? It makes sense there would be a lot of plastic sitting around after all these years. But wow, forget the measurements and just look at the photographs showing how much plastic is collected in some areas of the world's oceans. Due to shifting temperatures, currents, and hydrophobic plastic's natural tendency to cluster in a wet environment such as the ocean. There's still some debate about exactly how huge it is. But I don't think there's any disagreement that it is massive. Estimates of size range from 700,000 square kilometers or 270,000 square miles, roughly about the size of Texas, to more than 15 million square kilometers or 5,800,000 square miles, which is about the size of Russia. This uncertainty in size kind of makes sense because the boundaries of this new landmass are somewhat indistinct, and much of the plastic debris is in the form of small particles gathered near the ocean's surface. Most of the Pacific garbage patch is more like a thick plastic saltwater soup, a far worse situation than just one giant clump floating on the top. When scientists sampled what made up the floating mass, they found it was made up in large part of one chemical, polyethylene the most common plastic in our lives. Chances are, every Vanadium viewer has something composed of polyethylene within arm's reach at the very moment this video is being watched. Polyethylene is the most ubiquitous, and in terms of molecular structure, the simplest of the plastics, or polymers, as they're also called. To be accurate, plastic is a term for a subset of polymers, and is more a description of the thermal and mechanical behavior. Plasticity is the ability of a polymer to be remelted into liquid and formed into new shapes. Polyethylene, the most recognizable plastic material, is composed of a stack or chain of ethylene molecules linked atomically with lengths ranging from thousands to millions of units. Ethylene by itself is a sweet, musty smelling gas with a very simple atomic makeup. In order to get the individual ethylene molecules to assemble together, we need temperature, pressure, and something to upset the system, a molecular instrument of change, a clump of pure chaos, something such as a chemical free radical. The polymerization process comes in three phases. First, the initiation, the electrons making up the bonds in the starting compound, the monomer, get disrupted by the presence of the catalyst material nearby. This imbalance opens up a vulnerability in the ethylene double carbon-carbon bond. 
This perturbation in the chemical bond can influence neighboring ethylene molecules, causing a similar breakdown of that double bond and the potential of two ethylene units to join together. Each time this happens, it opens up the potential for the same thing to happen to another ethylene. Next, propagation. This is repeated and repeated with more and more starter material, up to millions of additions of the ethylene block to the growing polyethylene chain. Finally, the termination. The polymerization process ends and the molecular chains reach their maximum length. There are two main types, low-density polyethylene, LDPE, and high-density polyethylene, HDPE. The low-density version was created first, using a free radical polymerization process based on organic peroxides. The high-density version is created using a different form of initiator to start polymerization, called ziegler nada and Phillips catalysts. In the high-density version of polyethylene, there's more regularity in the additive chain growth, resulting in less branching in the molecular chains. These wonder materials, the brain children of generations of chemists and material scientists, are beautiful structures, feats of engineering. These nanostructures evolved out of human imagination, and they're so different that nature has trouble dealing with them. These plastic creatures of human imagination are so alien to the planet, chemically and physically distinct from everything else. There's a story from the mid 20th century about scientific first contact with an Amazonian tribe. And the story goes that the people who had never seen modern technology were bored by the radio and television, but fascinated by transparent plastic cellophane, asking what kind of rock it was made from. Many take materials like polyethylene for granted because of how common they are. But these things are amazing when you think about how long the road is to create them. The natural world is great at breaking things down with time, sun, water, temperature. Just about anything is ground down after a while. But some of these human plastics, they seem to be mostly immune from attack by the most destructive processes nature uses with time and aging. There are a few organisms that are stepping up and learning to help, who have potential to step into this human plastic situation and make it an actual sustainable natural cycle. The bacteria, Bacillus pseudofirmus. In 2019, it was found in a hyperalkaline lake in the Philippines that this bacteria breaks down and metabolizes low-density polyethylene. Galleria melanella, the greater wax or honeycomb moth, the caterpillars, they're capable of breaking down and eating polyethylene. And researchers discovered this from following up on observations of unexplained holes in plastic bags and insects in the area. Nature seems to be finding a way to tackle the polyethylene problem. Humans are also getting better at producing polyethylene and other plastics that actually biodegrade and can fit within a safe, natural, renewable cycle. Science has been developing ways to create polyethylene and other polymers using corn, food waste, and other sources without the use of traditional fossil fuel hydrocarbons. Still, it's amazing. If you are an extraterrestrial observer, you might look at humans' thirst for fossil fuels, ingenuity for transforming the structure of hydrocarbons, and a relentless, near unimaginable drive to create such an endless volume of this stuff, and think, they must really, really love plastic. Thank you very much. This is Vanadium, and I'm Chris Rankin.